has very much to do with issues we've been tracking all along. That modern romantic ideal places a great deal of value on authenticity, on one's dependence on the deeply and hence presumably truly felt, on the involuntary and unplanned, all as if marks of genuineness, all absorbing authenticity. A man or a woman who on a first date pulls out a questionnaire in order to investigate romantic possibilities, a person bound and determined to remain the independent subject controller of his or her life, is a fit subject of comedy, has misunderstood something basic about how all this works. Yet the transition from romantic intensity to bourgeois contract, the marriage contract, is what we tend to think of as the other equally indispensable side of this once all-absorbing romantic rapture. And that, of course, is not at all a bad thing. Given the depth and extent of human interdependence, such legally binding pledges of fidelity and aid are an indispensable dimension in the place of marriage and child-rearing in any social order. The, the institution thus manifests the independent subjectivity and will of the participants, as well as their acknowledgement of a vast network of social dependencies, and, as in these novels, the extreme difficulty of recognizing, reconciling these ideals of independence and dependence, the volitional and reflective, and the all-absorbing, passionately genuine. Nothing reflects better the ambiguity and still unresolved dialectical tension in the bourgeois ideal of freedom than a promise, indeed a contract, to love. The claim that this sort of historical and literary evidence is essential for philosophy and that this sort of appreciation of historical content is not available to one simply qua philosophers requires a much longer discussion than we can have tonight. But this sort of approach is important not just with respect to methodological issues in philosophy. The modest suggestion is that the sort of sweeping claims discussed here about the fate of the core ideal of bourgeois society in modernism, the claim about dead ends, false consciousness, historical exhaustion, and so forth, are premature. Surely we need to know first, in a great deal more detail, and in a way not thought of as traditionally philosophical, what a kind of life organized around such a commitment actually amounts to, what conflicts and even social pathologies it is heir to for the real historically situated participants in such a normative community. Secondly, I'd suggest one conclusion from this brief discussion. The puzzling dialectical aspect of independence as a component of freedom, it would appear, is that it can only be achieved and sustained as a collective ideal realized by means of a network of ever more complex interdependencies. Such dependencies would not then count as, would not be experienced as, unavoidable limitations on this aspiration to freedom, but as part of the realization of the ideal properly understood. From this flows what was at once the most beautiful and the most abused idea of late 19th century bourgeois thought, that no one individual can be free unless others ultimately all others, are as well. The complexity and dialectical oddness of such an idea means that we seem to be back at the frustrating situation described at the beginning of the talk, the best ideas having already been thought but are not seeing clearly yet what they mean. This is certainly true of the problem of the right way to understand the ideal of independent self-determination and so extensive entitlement at the heart of bourgeois modernity. Indeed, the difficulty was clear and brilliantly put already in 1762 in Denis Diderot's Rameau's Nephew, a dialogue between an ironic, always posing, theatrical character named Rui, him, and a settled, content family man and bourgeois, moi, me. At one exaggerated extreme, there is an ideal that celebrates the possibility of radical, self-defining independence a constant ironic detachment from one's role or practice or duty even, as if an actor capable of simply putting on and off roles and functions like costumes, not even tied to reason unless he happens to so tie himself for a while. That sort of ironic independence would be the epitome of freedom to such an actor, but would merely count as being lost, a gnomic, never truly who one is because always separated from oneself for another type, moi. Freedom might, by contrast, be understood as having found a role or function in life 
that is wholly absorbing, to which one does not remain simply attached, but into which one merges, free finally to be who one really is, where the ideal of any separation is inconceivable, would seem a great loss. This counter-ideal by moi, the faith that a modern form of domestic ordinariness can be wholly absorbing in this way, that it would be, to use the words introduced before, enough, is summed up at one point in a passage that will serve as my conclusion. Moi says in response to Louis' bohemian anti-bourgeois irony, quote, but I won't conceal from you that it's infinitely more pleasurable to me to have helped someone in distress, brought some difficult business to a conclusion, given some beneficial advice, read something agreeable, taken a walk with a man or woman close to my heart, passed some instructive hours with my children, written a good page, fulfilled the duties of my position, or told the woman I love something tender and soft so that she puts her arms around my neck. I know the sorts of actions I would give up all I own to have done. Thank you for your attention.